This is the Graceful Atheist Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Graceful Atheist Podcast. My name is David, and I am trying to be the Graceful Atheist. As always, I'm going to ask if you enjoy the podcast to please rate and review in the Apple Podcast Store or wherever you listen to this podcast. It helps others find the show. On to today's show. My guest today needs no introduction, but I'll attempt one anyway. Bart Campolo is the son of the famous evangelical preacher Tony Campolo. He is the podcast host of the Humanize Me podcast. He is an author of the Why I Left and Why I Stayed book. He is the subject, along with his father, in John Wright's Leaving My Father's Faith uh, documentary that's available on Amazon Prime. He is also the humanist chaplain at the University of Cincinnati. As you're going to hear, Bart has had quite an influence on me personally. Finding his voice post-deconversion was really important. I've talked a lot about the debate culture that's out there, the pure rationality, ivory tower perspective of many atheists, and how unsatisfying that is after about 15 minutes. So finding someone who is talking about A humanism that was boots on the ground, loving people, real blood, sweat, and tears humanity was really important. And that has had a deep and profound impact on what you hear here on this podcast. It's also hard to overstate the impact of finding the son of Tony Campolo to have deconverted. I don't waste much time in my conversation with Bart bringing this subject up, but For those of you who maybe have been atheists all your life, Tony Campolo is huge in the evangelical community. And so finding Bart Campolo, his son, had deconverted and was a humanist was just like finding an oasis in the middle of a desert. Suffice it to say, this is one of my favorite conversations that I have had so far. One of the great things about doing this podcast is I get to speak with people that I have a great deal of respect for, and Bart is certainly in that category. I'll stop fanboying out here now. I do want to point out that a couple of Humanize Me podcast episodes uh, will inform this episode. They are almost assumed knowledge in our conversation, and so I'll just highlight them here. One is an episode a few months back where Bart's son, Roman, really challenged Bart on a previous podcast episode that he had done in which he was a little less than hopeful about the continuation of the species of human beings. Uh, Roman really laid into him on this. And what's important about this is that Bart allowed this to take place in public As I've stated before many times, the ethos of this podcast is about brutal self-honesty. One of the subjects that Bart and I discuss is having our minds changed, having our minds changed by other people. And the second episode that you should probably listen to is the June 15th episode on facing up to collective trauma in which he discusses Black Lives Matter and ways that Bart himself needs to change his mind. And finally, a third episode, (laughs) the July 1st episode with Leah Helbling, who, by the way, is the podcast host of Women Beyond Faith, which is excellent. But in that, uh, Leah and Bart discuss the Cincinnati Humanist Group, their four ideals that they try to live up to, and that is a commitment to loving relationships, making things better for other people, cultivating gratitude and wonder in their lives, and world view humility and that's the one that bart talks about in this episode but never uses that term and so it might be a little confusing whether you listen to those uh before you listen to this podcast episode or afterwards they will help to bring in the context of what we discuss i often write down quotes from people during an episode and i found myself basically doing a transcript this episode It is target rich for quote mining, if that is your thing. Bart has just some amazing turns of phrase here that I think are really important. I want you to pay attention. I want you to listen to this episode more than once. It is that good. I need to add one more thing. 
Uh, I also have learned that the day after Bart and I recorded this session, Bart's father, Tony Campolo, had a stroke. And I just want to wish him well and the, the family well. Salute to you all. I hope a speedy recovery for Tony Campolo. Please also stay to the end of the episode in my final thoughts area. I'm going to tell a funny story that I had in, in Bible college that relates to Tony Campolo. Without further ado, I give you Bart Campbell. Bart Campbell, welcome to the Graceful Atheist Podcast. Well, thank you, David. It's nice to be here. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. You bet. So for the one or two people in the universe who listen to this podcast who don't know who you are, you are the uh, humanist chaplain at the University of Cincinnati. You are the podcast host of the Humanize Me podcast. You're an author of Why I Left and Why I Stayed, and you were part of the documentary with your dad, uh, Leaving My Father's Faith, which is on Amazon Prime these days. Is that correct? All of those things are true. Yes. So one of the things that I've noticed, I've only been doing this for you know a couple of years, but you start to hear people say things back to you that you've said before. So the first thing I wanted to say to you is you're probably going to hear a lot of things that are your way of saying things, because uh, if anything, this podcast is an homage to your work. Oh, what a nice thing to say. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really, really appreciate it. So you had suggested a a possible topic, and that kind of has gnawed on me overnight. So let's start with that. And that is this idea of gracefully talking to people with whom you have serious disagreements. And just recently... You've had a number of conversations that have been really interesting. Of course, your book and the Amazon Prime uh, story is with your dad, which must have been a very difficult conversation in the beginning. And then recently you had a conversation with your son where you had some disagreements. So talk to me a little bit about- On the podcast, yeah. Yeah, on the podcast. So talk to me a little bit about how you approach talking to people with whom you disagree. Well, you know, this is a strange moment in our- world and in our country you know like you can't there's no way to overstate that like this is a weird weird moment and and i think what's happening is is that an experience that i've had a lot around spirituality which is like how do you talk to somebody who really sees the world differently in such a way that it's almost like they're they're in a different universe Mm -hmm. than you are like they have a different set of rules and a different kind of worldview I think like that's happening to, in this country to everybody politically, that it used to be that Democrats and Republicans were sort of different flavors of the same coffee, mm-hmm. you know, and, and there was a sort of an understanding like, oh, yeah, like we share the same goals, but we have different sort of in- intuitions about how to get there. But it's now so polarized that it's sort of like, if you don't see the world the way I do, I think you're bad. Yeah. And I'm afraid of you. And and our, our media is such that we have not only different worldviews, but different facts. Like literally we get our information from different sources and it looks very different. You know, and now now around race. Yeah. That there's this conversation that's happening about race. And what I'm finding is is that in this kind of a setting, it is really hard to have a speculative conversation Hmm. with somebody. And by that, I mean, where you go like, hey, I think it might be this way. And the other person goes like, oh, no, no, no. I I, I think you're you're really missing this point. But like they sort of assume that you want to be corrected and that you're a good person who maybe has a different, has a wrong angle rather than you racist or you fascist or, you know, you person that hates America yeah. or, you know, that y- y- th- there's a s- sense in which it's very hard to have a conversation right now where you can float an idea without fear of being judged. Yeah. You know, where, where you can go like, right now I'm seeing it this way. And then also where you can listen to the other person and go like, oh, that makes sense. Okay. And change your mind. Right. And I feel like I got a head start on those conversations because when I left the Christian faith, you know, all the most significant people in my life were still in it. Hmm. 
And so I had to figure out a way to talk with those people. And it wasn't an option to go like, well, we just won't talk about Christianity or we just won't talk about faith. <laughs> yes. Because like that was the center of their lives. And that is the center of many of their lives. And my pursuit of goodness on the other side of faith is at the center of my life. Like it's not for me pursuing loving kindness as a way of life. That's not like a peripheral issue for me. It's the center of everything. Exactly. And so if we're not going to talk about our spiritual lives, if you will, even though my spirituality is secular, if we're not going to talk about that, we're not going to be very close. Yeah, you would lack an intimacy with the people that you love if you weren't able yeah. to talk about these things. So, so in some ways, it's, it's, it's a little bit like that with, like I live in a black neighborhood. And if we're not going to talk about race, <laughs> then we're not going to be very close. Yeah. And so we have to find a way to talk about this thing, even though it's really fraught and it's really painful. And I need to be open to changing my mind. And I think that that's the thing that if there's anything I've learned over the last 10 years since I left the faith, it's been about what are some of the rules of engagement for that kind of conversation? Yeah, very interesting. So just a topic or an idea that is a part of this podcast is what I call secular grace. And it's this idea that I observed while I was a Christian that what we really needed was grace with each other, with human to human. And then through the deconversion process, I realized, well, actually, yes, that's really critically important. We need to be not only loved, but accepted by one another without feeling judged. And it really does feel like that is something that we need for this moment in time. The thing that I find interesting about you and your work is that you tend to do this very publicly. So again, I mentioned the conversation you had with Roman, but also just recently you did, but you're on your podcast about Black Lives Matter and the ways that you need to learn. And so it's approaching it with a humility from your own side to be willing to recognize that Yes, I'm probably wrong in some areas and I need to learn. And at the same time, being loving or having a loving conversation in which everyone can participate. You know, I think, I think one of the crucial moments for me, and this was back in my Christian days, but like I was working with three or four friends on a big youth project. Mm -hmm. We, we were organizing, we, we got this huge grant from the Pew Charitable Trust and we were trying to put together this program and we had put it together and, and the guys, the, these guys that were buddies of mine were working on this one part of it. I was working on another part of it. And at one point they came to me and they said, listen, you need to let us go. We need to take this money, what's left of it. And we've got the thing going. And, and the thing that you're doing isn't a, like, we need to separate. And I was furious. I felt like they were so ungrateful. <laughs> and I, I had gotten this grant. I'd hired them all on. And now they wanted to kick me to the curb. And, and we went down and we were in this huge argument about it. And, you know, and what was funny was like there was race involved in this. One of them was black. One of them was Hispanic. And they were the strongest voices. And there was a sense in which they were saying like, you know, this is a program for inner city young people. Like we know what we're doing. What you're doing is a whole different thing and it's taking away from the project. And long and short is we're in this huge knockdown drag out argument. And the good news for me is I hold all the cards. Mm. I, I'm the one in control of the money. And like, they're asking me for something or demanding something, but like I can fire them all. <laughs> yes. I, I can do whatever I want. Yeah. But in the middle of the meeting, like as they're, as they're arguing, I sort of almost yell back at them. So what you're saying is, and I repeat their arguments. I mean, you're saying this because of this, because of this. And, they, and one of them goes, that's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And all of a sudden it hit me. They were right. Mm. Like I put it together. Like in my own words coming out of my mouth, I was like, wait, that's true. That, oh my gosh. And I sat there for a long second. I looked at him and I said, oh, I get it. Oh, so you're saying this. Right. And he goes, yeah, that's what he said. And I said, oh, that makes sense. And one of them looked at me and said, like, what are you trying to do here? What, what's the game? And I was like, no, no, no. 
I get it now. You're right. I need to let it go. And one of the guys in the room, I still remember this, a friend of mine named Chris Rock looked at me and he said, I've never seen this happen in my life. And I said, what? He said, I've never actually watched somebody change their mind in real life, in real time. Yeah. Like you just changed your mind. It is incredibly rare and publicly. But what was weird about it was, is that all the flood of love that flowed into that room, like those guys loved me in that moment and have stayed like they, they would all, they're all loyal to a fault to me now. Yeah. And there was such an exhilaration of going like, Oh, I was wrong. And like, Changing my mind meant I took a step closer to being right or to being good, to being in the truth. And for the life of me, David, I don't understand why we don't teach kids when we beat them in an argument to go like, how does it feel to be truer than you were? Or like when, when we win in an argument, I don't know why we don't stop. And instead of going like, ha ha, I beat you, go like, oh my gosh, you did it. Yeah. You did it. Because changing my mind or having my mind changed for me by the evidence or by somebody else's better argument, to me, is like the ultimate expression of my human potential. Mm. Like every human advancement, every bit of progress, everything good that's happened in our species has been the result of somebody going like, oh, I was wrong. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like, oh, oh, wait, so all the planets don't revolve around the Earth? Or, oh my gosh, you mean all this differentiation of species, like complexity grows out of simplicity, not the other way around? You go like, this is amazing. Like, it's all about changing your mind. Yeah. And so for me... What I found in that moment and have found subsequent to that is that the ultimate, like in a sense, what strengthens us, what makes us feel powerful is not when we have the ability to, to manipulate or to change other people, to bend them to our will, but when we have the ability to change ourselves. Yes. And so for me, I guess early on in the game, I sort of figured out like, oh, this is real power and this is real security. And this is also like very selfishly, you want to get people to like you? Let them change your mind. Yeah. Like be open to them changing your mind. And what's interesting too is, is then, they, then they become more open to you changing their mind. Right, you've built some trust. So for me, that's the key. I have this wonderful quote from Alan Alda where he says like, I have this radical idea that if I'm not open to letting you change my mind, I'm not really listening to you. Mm. And I think so much of the conversation I see going on right now is one person's talking and the other person's not even listening. They're, they're only listening to try to craft what they're going to say in response. But like, there's no openness to having their mind changed. They're just, they're just looking for like, how do I retort to this? Nobody's listening. Yeah. Ironically, we as deconverts have the experience of discovering that we were mistaken, discovering that we were wrong on something deeply fundamental. In some ways, we have a leg up to have that kind of humility when we go into a conversation. Some of us do. I mean, one of the big questions when somebody loses their faith or deconstructs or however you want to describe that process, whether it's passive or active, I mean, because in many ways, you know, my mind changed. I didn't change it. Right. You know, if I could have stopped the process halfway through, I probably would have. It would have saved me a lot of time and trouble. Right. <laughs> yes. And money. And, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, and so, so sometimes people are, feel very betrayed by you when you leave the faith. And, you know, I'm always at great pains to say like, hey, like, I'm really sorry that this is hurting you. But like, it wasn't my choice. This happened to me. Right. Now I have to figure out how to make the most of it. But like, it's not that I won't believe in God or I refuse to believe in God. I, I, I can't. I don't. You know, and I'm unable to. But 
the real question is, when that happens to you, some of us end up, that ends up being a liberation into a new kind of enthusiasm and a new kind of opportunity to live. Because we replace that worldview with another one that sort of inspires us to want to keep growing and, and to keep loving and to keep building connections. Like we create a new religion in place of the old one. And, and, and for some people, it's just, a, it's just a loss. And so I think that having your mind changed feels really different if it gets changed from something into something else and that something else is freer and more vibrant and fits better. And I think it's very different when you have your worldview gets broken and you, you just sit there with the broken pieces trying to figure out how to get back what you've lost. Yeah. And so, you know, that's why I'm very, very cautious about undermining somebody's Christianity because there's no guarantee that if you undermine their faith in God, that they will then turn into a vibrant, enthusiastic humanist. There's a very real chance that they will just be broken. Yeah. And that is actually something that I say on this podcast often, that I just have no desire to try to take away the faith, particularly from the people that I love, uh, who I perceive aren't ready. They would be asking questions if they were ready. And so I have all the patience in the world with the people that I love and their faith. Unless they're hurting people with it, or unless they're hurting themselves with it. And you know, you sometimes see that, like, there are people for whom I'm like, listen, you know, that's, that's hurting you, baby. <laughs> yes. You know, people for whom that narrative always casts them in the loser light and in the, in the failure light. And so, and so you know, there's another way of looking at the world. There's another way of, of living. But yeah, when you see somebody who's sort of bearing fruit in that Christian world and you go like, yeah, but it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's insanity. It, it, none of it makes sense. There's no evidence for it. I go like, yeah, 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 but be careful because you take away their illusion they may not be able to piece together a reality that works for them. Yeah. In this moment, I think the essence of the big thing is there are a bunch of us that have changed our minds for the better or have experienced sort of like the thrill of going like, oh, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And the sort of sense of power and the security that it gives you because you go like, oh, what that means is like, Maybe if I'm wrong about something else, like I'll figure that out too. Or maybe, maybe there's a way in which this bad relationship that I'm in, hey, my, some of it might be my fault. Or maybe <laughs> that terrible conversation that we had, if it's all about them, I have no control. But like if I have a part to play, maybe I can make it better. Yeah. And so once you have that experience, like there's almost a, a giddiness that says, please help me understand, like, what am I doing in this conversation that's making you so angry? And I think that that's for me the key to the whole thing is, is that when I fight, like when you talk about like, there was this episode that I did with this guy, Michael Dowd, and it was about kind of what's going on in the world and, and, and sort of collapsarian thinking. And Michael Dowd and I got going on that stuff and I can get going on that stuff. And my son called me the next week. He's like, I hated that. That, that was a, a horrible thing. And, and like, I ended up bringing him on the podcast and he just ripped me to shreds on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, is if you listen carefully to the podcast, what you'll see is, is that we're arguing about the thing, but we're also having a meta conversation about how we're talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is that like, even when he and I are really on the opposite side of the issue, it's the same with my dad. Like, this is like a thing that we've learned is that you still need to have a conversation that says, listen, when you use that really calm voice, it really bothers me. Like, could you just... Or, you know, like, you're not letting me finish my sentences. And I need, like, you got to let me finish here. And, and so then we're not talking about the collapse of the world or about global warming. Then we're talking about how are you talking to me and how am I talking to you? Right. And on that conversation, Roman and I are both committed to, like, oh, we want to have a good conversation. And so, like, if I'm messing up the conversation, tell me. And that's the first place where you can give ground and give right. easy. If somebody says, I don't like the way you're talking to me, you go like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, yeah that, and that's easy to change. That's an easy place to give ground. 
But that's also the place where you demonstrate you, my friend, are more important than winning this conversation. You may not be more important than the issue that we're talking about, but you're more important than this conversation about that issue. Right. It's more important that we live to fight another day as a team or as a family or as a friendship than me winning this. No one battle is worth losing that war. Yeah. And you demonstrate that when you're willing to modify the way you talk. So I want to kind of synthesize what we've been discussing here. And I want to ask you directly as a humanist chaplain and, you know, you have a famous dad and you have this platform on your podcast in a moment like now in the middle of COVID-19 in the middle of race relations, the tragedy of George Floyd, the problems with police departments, all, all of the things that we're experiencing in the United States, you mentioned all the politics and we can't talk to each other. Do you feel a responsibility to be hopeful, to be a prophet of hope, a proclaimer of hope? It's funny because I think that people, people often will say to my family, Bart's such a positive guy. You know, he's such a positive guy. And my family just laugh. (laughs) And they just go like, oh my gosh, like this is the most relentlessly negative person ever. Like who will explain to you why this car won't work, why this new piece of furniture won't work, why our vacation's going to suck. Like I struggle with negativity in real life. Yeah. Um, And so I think for precisely that reason, perhaps, I've become a student of hope. And I do feel a responsibility to be hopeful, but to be hopeful in a way that, like, I'm hopeful but not optimistic. Like, optimistic says, I think everything's going to work out. Mm. And I don't. I don't think there's any reason to think everything will ever work out. Like anybody who comes telling me that like in the end, if we, you know, if we use their system or if we buy into their religion, like there will be eternal nirvana at the end of it. I don't believe in eternal nirvana. I don't believe in utopia. Yeah. I think that conflict is baked in. I don't even know if this species makes it out of here alive. The universe just keeps churning. And at some point I think we get churned in too. My commitment to humanism is like, this is the species I'm part of. This is my tribe. And as long as we're here, I want to make the best of this human experience. I love the human experience. I'm not saying it's eternal. I'm not saying it'll ever be perfect. I'm just saying like, I'm committed to it. Right. So my hopefulness is not about utopianism. My hopefulness is this idea of like, things probably won't work out. But in the midst of them not working out, I think that what I do might make a difference for somebody. I think I have some agency here. I think I might be able to offer some comfort. I think I might be able to prolong our time a little bit. I think I might be able to make things brighter on the corner where I live. And so I think what happens is sometimes in the face of these large issues, people go like, listen, nothing I do makes a difference. Like there's nothing I can do about it. These issues and these forces at work in our society are are beyond my control. And I go like, yeah, 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 that that's true. But you still have agency. You still can make a difference. There's still something you can do that matter. Yeah. And so I do feel an obligation to tell that story. Right. And try to, in a sense, motivate people to make the most of this opportunity. You know, I mean, when you leave Christianity, some people are like, well, if there's no heaven and there's no hell and we don't live forever, then what's the point of all this anyway? Like if it does, if nothing lasts, why bother? And I go like, listen, cause like you have this moment. Yeah. Like, like this, this matters. Like, yeah. like this day matters. And I feel like that's, that's the same reality where where you go like, well, if I can't really affect the whole system, if I can't change everything for the better, then what's the point? And I go like, ah, because this day matters, this moment matters, this person matters. And and they matter because you care about them. Yeah. So I I do feel, I do feel a a dry, part of it is I have to talk myself into acting hopefully every day. 
And so part of it is, you know, just like that preacher who's in the pulpit saying, pornography is the, the great evil and we must fight against <laughs> sexual immorality. And you go like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder what, I wonder what's on his computer. Like, right. <laughs> you, you know, because <laughs> right, the, right, the, the ones that rail against it the loudest, it's because like they're struggling with it. And so yeah. like when you see somebody like doing like this super upbeat, warm, fuzzy, hopeful, humanize me podcast. You go like, I wonder if that guy has a heart of darkness. Like, of course he, of course he does. Of course yes. he does. Yeah, yeah. And and he's he's preaching to himself. Yeah. Well, I think when you did the conversation with Roman, one of my comments was that you are at the top of your game when you are talking about hope, and it may be Bart that because we lack that, we lack that kind of leadership in the world. There are very few voices who are proclaiming hope. And so I think maybe that was what Roman was reacting to is when you are not hopeless, but less hopeful that that is kind of diminishing uh, somehow the work that you do. Yeah. He's sort of like, we count on you. We, Hey buddy, we're, we're counting on you. This is what, we, yeah, we need you. You know, in the family, he's like, this is what, like, we, we need you. Like be, you, you gotta be your best self for us. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think that that is as good a reason as any, I think for a lot of people that are struggling in this COVID thing and struggling in this racial moment is that part of the problem of being cut off from each other is that it's the other people that tend to motivate us to do our best. Yes. And so when we get isolated, a lot of times we lose momentum because, you know, all this idea of self-interest to the contrary, human beings are a tribal species. and we're motivated by one another and by our concern for one another. And, and you know, that, that's sort of our evolutionary trick. Yeah. That's how you get people to like give it up for the tribe and, you know, to make great sacrifices is, is you build into them a sense of like that my destiny is wrapped up with yours. And that, you know, in a sense, like I'm more concerned about my DNA going forward than I am about my body. Which, which is a very sciencey way of saying it. But like what it says is like, you know, I'm part of something bigger than myself. Yes. And when you leave religion, people go like, oh, I miss that. I miss that sense of being part of the kingdom of God, being part of a larger destiny. And I sort of go like, you know, there's this other story about, you know, about life sort of emerging out of nothing, like out of the elements and organizing itself into a place of consciousness and meaning and then discovering a pathway that says that like love is the ultimate survival skill. Like you actually are part of something much bigger than yourself. Yeah. And actually if you check your impulses to breathe and to have sex and to eat and to find shelter, like they are all wrapped up in not just surviving, but propagating this way of life right and this form of life and so yeah you know what it, you cut people off from each other and you cut them off from literally the thing that makes life worth living so we've been dancing around it just a little bit i find after deconversion you know the first thing that you see online is a lot of what i call debate culture very christians are wrong and atheists are right and <laughs> And it took me a while to find the humanist voices like yourself. Tell me what does humanism mean for you? Why do you use that label at all? And just define it for me. Oh, you know, that's, that's a good question because like I'm not, you know, for somebody who's like a fairly well-known humanist, like I'm not really that comfortable with the term. Mm, okay. Winston Churchill once said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. Right. And I tend to think like humanism is the worst thing to call myself, except for all the others. Like, I don't call myself an atheist, even though I am one, because atheist means without God. And, and I live my life without any kind of connection or, or consciousness or, or, you know, belief in God. Mm -hmm. But when you say the word atheist in our culture, a lot of times people interpret that as against God or against people who believe in God. Right. And so I'm like, ah, I don't want to be associated with that. I'm not one of those angry people that wants to tear it all down. And I have a lot of respect for what believing in God did for our species. It was a stage along the way. Yeah. It was the best story we had at the time. 
and a lot of the good stuff that we have now. In fact, the ability to conceptualize a world without God, that stuff got hammered out by people who are educated in the universities built by the belief in God. Mm. You know, so I, 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 I'm a great respecter of what brought me here. So anyway, I don't want to be called an atheist. Agnostic, I know what it means is like doesn't know or sort of, and again, technically I am agnostic. Like I can't prove that there is no God or that, that I can't even prove that this universe isn't a simulation in somebody else's computer model. Right. Like that we're not all in the matrix. I can't prove that definitively. Yeah. So I am agnostic, but again, like it makes it sound like I'm not sure. And I'm really sure about what I value. And I'm really sure about the way I'm living my life. And like, I'm not like paralyzed by uncertainty. So I don't use that word. Right. Free thinker. Like, I, I understand, like, that's a lovely term. And like, I aspire to be a free thinker, but like, come on. <laughs> you don't have to st you don't have to study cognitive biases very long yes or anthropology very long to know like even the fact that i don't believe in god i can't take really credit for it right like i was raised in such a way that i am able not to believe in god if i had been raised in a different place if i had a different brain if i had a different cultural mindset i wouldn't like i can't even take credit for the way i think so yeah no i'm not going to call myself a free thinker i wish yeah. i was and skeptic, again, makes it sound like I'm, I'm, I'm walking around the world looking for things to take issue with or to, to find trouble with. And again, like technically, skepticism is kind of like a scientific word, and it's a good thing to be. Sure. But in the end, what I want to communicate to people is like, yeah, I don't believe in God, but I'm really committed to life. And in particular, I'm really committed to human life and to trying to make as much meaning as I can in the context of this human life by loving other people. And so like humanist is kind of the, it, it at least connotes the idea that like, it's not what I don't believe in that defines me. It's what I am committed to. Right. And if somebody says, so you're committed to humanity. I go like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be my ultimate commitment. Right. Yeah. So, I, you know, calling myself a humanist, it's, like I said, it's just better than all the others. But like, if you ask me to, to define humanism, I would go like, oh man, and it's like Christianity. Like, there's a thousand, you know, there's as many different forms of Christianity as there are Christians. Right. To me, when I realized that I had to figure out how to get on without God, you know, I sort of was like, well, you know, I, I started to sort of go like, I, I want to make the most of this life. It, it, it still feels really like a privilege to have it. And I did some research and I looked around and I read a bunch of books by people and I kind of came to the conclusion like, you know, Loving relationships is the thing. Like the people that live their lives the longest and sort of die the happiest are people that have a handful of loving relationships and that spend their lives doing things to make things better for other people and that have a sense of gratitude and 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 that cultivate that. And that like, like the more grateful I am, the happier I am. And so like I came to the place where I was like, that's what I want to pursue. So if somebody says to me, what's your humanism? It goes, oh, it, you know, a humanist is somebody who like is really committed to loving relationships and making things better for other people and cultivating gratitude and wonder in their life and who's smart enough to recognize that like just because that works for them doesn't mean it would work for everybody. Right. Exactly. And so that's my definition of humanism. Like like my little fellowship here in Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Caravan, those four values, like we ran them up the flag and a bunch of people, secular people were like, that sounds ridiculous. That sounds like old time religion. Like, oh, commitment to, you know, and then a bunch of other people were like, oh my gosh, that's what I've been looking for. Like I miss, right. I miss that sense of focus. So it's so like, we're going to be a community that helps each other pursue loving kindness as a way of life. And they were like, count me in. Yeah. They're like, okay. So for us, that's our humanism. Right. But like for somebody else, it means something very, very different. So yeah, man, you've touched on several things there. I, what I talk about a lot is that just because we no longer have a particular set of metaphysics does not mean that we don't need each other, that we don't need community, that we don't need to have a sense of belonging, that we don't need to experience all. We need all those things. Those are hardwired human needs. But you know what, David? Different people need different amounts of them. Ah, uh, that's interesting. Like, yeah. See, when I came out of Christianity... The Christianity went first, but the fundamentalism stayed with me a lot longer. And I went from thinking that Jesus was the one true path to going like, 
I got to figure out what the one true path is. And like, mm. I was, you know, I became convinced it was this like commitment to like community and that human beings were tribal species and stuff like that. And then I started meeting like autistic people, you know, yeah, or people that had, you know, had been traumatized by certain kinds of relationships. And they were like, yeah, I don't want to, like, I, I don't want to venture into that. And these people were still finding ways to be connected to something some of them to music. Some of them were connected to, to other humans in an indirect way. Like they would stay alone in their room coding and create things that would be helpful to other people, but they didn't want to talk to those people. Right. I can relate. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, like not all of a sudden, but slowly it dawned on me, you're still a fundamentalist, Bart. Hmm. You still want to come up with a way of life that works for you and then suggest that that's what all human beings need. You know, at this stage in the game, that's part of my, what I guess you would call it worldview humility, where I go like, think of about a bell curve, you know, where like most people are, in, are close to the center of it. And I go like, I think for the vast majority of human beings, this business of like a handful of loving relationships and a sense of doing something that makes things better for other people and is meaningful and a sense of gratitude, I think that will work for a lot of people. Yeah. But I, I'm not here to impose it on anybody because I know that there are people for whom that wouldn't be the right cocktail that wouldn't be the right formula right and so i think there are a lot of different ways to make meaning this is the one that sort of works for me and so when i meet people that are struggling and that are sad i tend to say to them hey this is this thing my friends and i are doing and it's working for us like maybe this would work for you but when i see somebody who's happily moving through life in a different way I am not prone to go like, listen, you really need to, you know, it's like, I'm telling you, 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 you're fooling yourself. You, you're not really happy behind that computer screen. You really won't be happy until you're more like me. Right. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm taking that all in and I totally agree with you. In fact, one of the things that I talk about whenever I talk about humanism is the beauty of it is that you can choose not to do it. <laughs> and that unlike more enforced religious doctrines humanism allows for the great diversity within humanity yeah because you're because somebody doing it a different way isn't an implicit challenge to mine like in christianity if somebody's thriving outside of christianity that's a problem because my religion teaches that you can't thrive outside of christianity so i have to find a way of explaining like that's what my dad used to do with me when i first left the faith he just kept trying to like poke holes in my humanism and sort of go, this can't be working for you because if this works for you, it implicitly challenges my sense that without Jesus, life is meaningless. Right. And at one point I was finally like, dad, it's like, you want my humanism to fail. And the thing is like, do you think if you convince me that without believing in God, I'm bound to be suicidal and miserable, do you think that'll make me believe in God again? Wow. And he said, he said, no. I said, yeah, I can't believe in God. That makes it like, it doesn't make sense to me. So I said, if you convince me that I can't find meaning without God, all you will do is convince me that I am a hopeless wreck of despair. Mm. And that kind of backed him off a little bit is what I said. It's like, you need to hope that there's meaning outside of Christianity or else your son is doomed. Right. And I think as a humanist, I need to do the same thing. I need to hope that there are multiple ways because there are a lot of people for whom this way of thinking, like there are a lot of people who are hardwired to believe in a supernatural force. Yes. And they're not able not to. And so, boy, we better hope that there's a way for those people to thrive and there's a way for those people to feel a sense of, joy in their lives yeah because otherwise we have nothing to offer them hmm. and so i like the, the thing is like it, it's not threatening to me when somebody thrives by another path right like exactly. it doesn't bother me you know my evangelism i'm not looking to, to talk anybody out of anything that's working for them i'm looking for people who their shit is not working the stuff is just not working <laughs> yes and those are the people that i'm like look You've tried all these other things. Have you tried this thing? Because here's a way of living. Here's a way of looking at the universe that might work for you. 
but I want to tee up kind of a last idea. Tee it up, David. Yeah. Tee it up. <laughs> you hit on this and what you just were talking about. We often hear from particularly apologists, right? I, I often make the distinction between the regular believer in the pew and the apologist. But they're often trying to invalidate humanism or anything outside of Christianity. Of course. We come along as humanists and we say, you know, there may not be inherent meaning in the universe, but we as human beings are meaning makers. And we find somehow, you and I and and many others have found a way for that to be really deeply, profoundly useful, purposeful meaning making. How is it that, that you make meaning? How do you teach others to make meaning? Oh, that's that's your that's your question. That's yes. your last question. <laughs> oh, thanks. thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, just an easy one for the on the way out. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny when you mention apologists. I just got a note from somebody that there's evidently there's this apologist out there. I guess she's fairly well known. Her name is Alyssa Childers. Uh-huh. He sent me this interview that she was doing in which she talks about me, and and I thought, oh, she's going to say crappy things about me. And he says, no, no, no. What she says is, she says she doesn't understand progressive Christianity because she's like, if you don't believe in the resurrection and you don't believe that you know God made the world in seven days and if you don't believe in the virgin birth, she said, I like Bart Campola because like he admits that like, if you don't believe in any of those things, you probably should stop calling yourself a Christian. Right. But, but then I listened to a little bit more of what she said. And, I, I, and I'm, apologists, just, they, they just freak me out because what she basically said is like, the great thing about apologetics is is that it convinces you that God is real even if there's no evidence, even if you don't (laughs) feel anything, even if God never answers a prayer, like, but you, you still know it's real. And I just thought, gosh, you know, lady, you and I are wired differently. That is not a selling point for me. Yeah. So, but the, the thing is, is that we see people make meaning in different ways. And I think that the thing that troubles me the most is not when somebody is making it in a way that doesn't make sense to me, but when somebody seems to have no appetite for meaning, when somebody is, seems unmotivated, when they are listless, um, when, they're, when they're willing to just exist rather than to live. My, one of my favorite send-off lines is Maurice Sendak in his last interview with Terry Gross before he died. He just told her how much he loved being alive and how much he had had a great time and how much he loved knowing her. And he said, Terry, I'm never going to talk to you again. So let me just say it to you. Live your life. Live your life. Live your life. And, and you know, it broke her down. It broke me yeah. down. Yeah. You know, because there's a sense in which there's a purposefulness to that. There's a sense in which don't let your life just happen. Live it. You know, and so the question I, I think that's always even before I became a humanist, even when I was in Christianity working in the inner city, was how do you give somebody an appetite for life that doesn't have one? And I wish I could say I I knew the answer. What I do know is this, is that when I was a kid in math, they would would do these tests and they would give you the, the question and then they would say, you know, like, what's the, what's the square root of this, you know, or what's the quadratic form here? And then they would always be like, show your work. Right. Like, it wasn't enough to put down the answer. You had to show how you got there. Yeah. And I think that I see a lot of people like you, like me, who seem to be living their lives. And the question is, are you willing to show your work? Mm. Are you willing to to articulate the process, you know, are you willing to talk about how you find the books that you read? Not just the books you read, but like how you found it. Right. And are you willing to talk about like the hard conversation you had with your mom? Are you willing to share about your, your battle with depression? And are you willing to talk about not just what you love, but why you love it? Like it takes a lot of effort to explain to a child why we're going to go on the trip that mom planned for us this on Saturday, even though none of us really want to go because <laughs> mom, mom put a lot of effort into planning it and we're not going to let her down. We're going to go and we're going to make it a good time. And it takes a lot of effort to explain to a kid like, 
why you sometimes do something you don't want to do because you care about the person who planned it. Right. It's easier just to say to the kid, I'm the dad, you're the kid, get in the car, we're going. And sometimes that's appropriate, but then you got to circle back and say, hey, can I tell you how that worked? Can I tell you why I did that? Sometimes why I did the wrong thing, but sometimes why I did the right thing and why it matters. In my experience, people develop an appetite for something like coffee, not just when they taste it, but when somebody explains to them why they love it and what to look for hmm. and, and, you know, or fly fishing or bicycle racing or whatever it is. It's somebody has to not only sort of go like, look, isn't this cool? But they have to say to you, this is what I love about it. This, th look at the nuance here. Like, you're not going to notice this, but there's actually a difference between that tire and this tire. And that's why we pick that tire for this kind of race. And, and they may not end up loving bike racing, but that's how you teach people what it is to be passionate about something, to be interested in something, to develop a taste for something. And frankly, I don't care what you develop a passion or a taste for nearly as much as I, as I want you to have one. And so I think if I was a young parent again, um, I'm a grandparent, so I'm, I'm getting to do it a little bit over. If I'm a friend of somebody who's discouraged or depressed, I think there's a tendency to want to talk at that person and tell them what they need to do. And I think you're probably better off showing your work showing the work of being alive and talking about it openly and becoming articulate about why you do the things you do and why they mean something to you. And to that end, I'm going to give you a book recommendation. Oh, it's going to freak you out. Okay. Okay. And, and it's, it's the best book I've read in the last week, but it's a classic. I just finished reading Albert Camus, The Plague. Okay. And it is a particularly apt book during the COVID-19 thing. Although the plague he's talking about is the bubonic plague and these people are locked down in a village and they can't get out and people are dying left and right. And the doctor at the center of it is the true humanist who makes meaning out of thin air and figures out what really matters. Hmm. And in the book, and I won't give you the trick ending. Okay. Because it's worth getting to. What I will tell you is, is that in the book, there's a sense in which the great skill of the writer is, is that the doctor shows his work. He shows what it takes to care at a time when it would be so easy to despair. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's a beautiful example of what I'm talking about. I think one of the most humanizing things we can do for other people is to show our work. I think that is a great place to stop. I'm going to keep that, Bart, show your work. I'm going to for sure be telling other people about that as well. Bart, let people know how they can get in touch with you. Listen, th there's only one thing I do that has any significance outside of my little community here in Cincinnati, and that's my podcast, Humanize Me. And it's a place where I, I bring on other people and talk and I'm always like trying to find out from other people what they have to teach me about making the most of this life. And I'm glad that you listen to it, David. I'm glad you like it. I'm always glad when people like it. And for a lot of people, they get on, they go, that guy's way too earnest. I can't stand him. I, I have to turn him off. That boy, he reminds me of a youth pastor um, and, 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 and it triggers me. But for those of you that can stomach it, that's probably the thing I do that, that has the most oomph. And I, I send out a little email every week when I send out the podcast. That's my little sort of our daily bread devotional. And from what I can tell from the feedback that I get, there's a subset of human beings for whom that stuff is helpful. You know, and, and if you go to humanizeme.com, like there's a place where it says contact Bart, the emails all come to me and I answer them slowly, but I do. So yeah, I'm, I'm grateful to you for, for letting me into your circle and letting me meet your people. Yeah. And, and if any of them are interested, I'm easy to find, as you know. But it, it, it is really good to talk with you. Thanks so much. It has been, this has been a great conversation, Bart. I yeah. really appreciate you giving me your time. Thank you so much. All right, brother. Final thoughts on the episode. As I said in the intro, 
if I began quoting Bart here, I would just restate the entire thing. Listen to the episode again. It's fantastic. I'll just really harp on show you work. That is something that I literally have written up on my whiteboard to remind me. It is a simple idea that has been haunting me for the past week or so after we recorded this episode. Uh, and it will affect the way that I parent my kids from now on. That's all I can say about that. The one thing I think that is interesting from our conversation that I'll point out here is Bart pushing back on me about what I call the ABCs of secular spirituality, awe, belonging, and community. Uh, he pointed out that not everybody needs these things, or not everybody needs them in the same degree or amounts. Uh, and it's important for me to hear that. Like, I, I do think that that is a, an important human need, but it doesn't mean that everyone needs it in the same way that I do. I'm assuming that if you're listening to this podcast that you think those things are important to some degree or another. But there are many secular people, many atheists out there who it sounds too much like religion. It sounds too much like their former church experience. And it could even be triggering. It could be trauma-inducing. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge that. And I think that that's very true. While I will continue to talk about the secular ABCs of spirituality, I will do so with greater humility, the, the worldview humility that Bart talks about. I want to thank Bart for the amazing humility, integrity, honesty, grace with which he handles himself in public as well as on this episode. I want to thank him for doing the work that he does, for being hopeful in a time of hopelessness, and for admitting when he makes mistakes and being willing to change his mind. I think all of that is an incredible example, and it is Bart Campolo showing his work. Thank you, Bart. Again, I want to say I hope a speedy recovery for Tono Campolo after the stroke that he had on June 20th. I hope that the Campolo family, that all of you are well. Bart, I didn't bring this topic up because we had a short amount of time for our recording session, but I did want to tell this crazy story. Uh, I was in Bible college, in a very conservative Bible college in the 90s, and my roommate was a huge, huge fan of Tony Campolo. At the time, Tony was very famous for a provocative statement that he made in a speech, and I'll quote it here. Quote, I have three things I'd like to say today. First, while you were sleeping last night, 30,000 kids died of starvation or disease related to malnutrition. Second, most of you don't give a shit. What's worse is that you are more upset with the fact that I just said shit than the fact that 30,000 kids died last night. As you might imagine, that had quite an impact on people. So, uh, in Bible college, I have a roommate who was enamored with this statement who decided in chapel to quote Tony <laughs> verbatim. As you can imagine, this did not go well. <laughs> and I just wanted to share that with you. It's a memory that is emblazoned in my mind. Thank you, Tony, for saying that. As always, my name is David, and I am trying to be the Graceful Atheist. Join me and be graceful human beings. Time for some footnotes. The song is a track called Waves by Micaiah Beats. Please check out her music. Links will be in the show notes. If you'd like to help support the podcast, here are the ways you can go about that. First, help promote it. The podcast audience grows by word of mouth. If you found it useful or just entertaining, please pass it on to your friends and family. Post about it on social media so that others can find it. Please rate and review the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. This will help raise the visibility of our show. Join me on the podcast. Tell your story. Have you gone through a faith transition? You want to tell that to the world? Let me know and let's have you on. Do you know someone who needs to tell their story? Let them know. Do you have criticisms about atheism or humanism, but you're willing to have an honesty contest with me? Come on the show. If you have a book or a blog that you want to promote, I'd like to hear from you. Also, you can contribute technical support. If you are good at graphic design, sound engineering, or marketing, please let me know and I'll let you know how you can participate. And finally, financial support. 
There will be a link on the show notes to allow contributions, which would help defray the cost of producing the show. If you want to get in touch with me, you can Google Graceful Atheist, or you can send email to gracefulatheist at gmail.com. You can tweet at me at Graceful Atheist, or you can just check out my website at gracefulatheist.wordpress.com. Get in touch and let me know if you appreciate the podcast. Well, this has been the Graceful Atheist Podcast. My name is David, and I am trying to be the Graceful Atheist. Grab somebody you love and tell them how much they mean to you. This has been the Graceful Atheist Podcast.